Your Humanities Half Hour is brought to you by the Northern Marianas Humanities Council. Welcome to Your Humanities Half Hour. I'm Catherine Perry. Our guest today helps open the world to a treasure trove of Micronesian literature. She's the Interim Director of Publishing at the University of Guam Press, Victoria Lola Leon Guerrero. Lola, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for being here. Maybe you could start us off with just telling us what is the University of Guam Press and what is your mission? Yeah, so the University of Guam Press is uh, an active publishing house at the University of Guam's Micronesian Area Research Center. And so um, the MARC, <laughs> that's uh, the acronym for our center, um, has long been the largest repository for uh, information about Micronesia. And so it's an incredible um, place to be because, um, you know, we revived the press in 2015, but the mark has always, you know, uh, published different kinds of historical accounts and um, historical publications about Micronesia. Um, and so it was, it's the perfect place to be in terms of, you know, being able to access uh, archival photos and books um, to support some of our publishing. Um, but the press really, the mission of the press is really to make knowledge about um, the peoples and cultures of Micronesia available to our islands and to the world. And so um, we've been really committed to increasing the number of publications authored by Indigenous writers um, in our Indigenous languages. Um, we have a beautiful collection of Chamorro children's books, um, incredible poetry books, um, we have we recently published a acclaimed book called The Properties of Perpetual Light by um, attorney Julian Uggen, which had received praise around the world. Um, you know, we have a collection of Chamorro legends that is a flip book. So in one side, it's in English and the other side, it's in Chamorro. Um, and, you know, just so much in terms of really um, identifying you know, who are the voices in our community that, um, you know, really have important things to say and how do we capture this in book form? And so we've, we're really here to um, be, like I said, an active publishing house, but also to support writers who want to publish. And so kind of what distinguishes, I think, UOG Press and our efforts is that, you um, we have an open call for submissions um, in which people can submit a manuscript and receive, uh, you know, a review from scholars and community members um, that will look at their manuscripts, you know, their names are removed. So they look at the writing and they give them that initial feedback that really says, okay, you know, is this book ready for publication? And if it isn't, here's some really great feedback to help you get there. And so I think, you know, the fact that all of our books are, they go through a peer review process um, is really useful to writers, I believe, because it gives you a sense of, okay, what will be the impact of my book and how do I get it to what I want it to be. Uh, and then when a book is accepted, we provide, you know, extensive copy and content editing, beautiful design. Um, we, you know, we print it in high quality uh, form and we're able to distribute books all throughout Micronesia and the world. And so we distribute our books in all, you know, local bookstores on our website, on Amazon. And now we're exploring, you know, larger distribution partnerships to make sure that our books get everywhere where books can be so that our stories can be told to a larger audience. And so, um, yeah, that's pretty much what we do. Um, we also identify books that our community desires. So for example, uh, when we first started, people were always asking for Chamorro Legends books. So we got a grant and sought out um, an author and we had, um, 
and sought out a really great translator and then did a call for local artists. So our Legends book really was a community effort in that way. Um, you know, other things that our community has always wanted, um, for example, our textbooks, right? So it has always been really, um, you know, sad for me to think that we go to school for K through 12 and we read books from so far away that don't tell our stories, that don't feature our people in them. And so, you know, one of the things um, from the beginning of kind of being part of the revival of the press that was important was to really work with our school district to make sure that the books we were made, making were going into the classrooms, um, but also to identify, okay, let's make our own textbooks. And so we are currently in a contract with the Guam Department of Education, and we're developing um, six textbooks, kinder through fifth grade social studies textbooks, because if there's a subject where you're supposed to learn about yourself, it really should be social studies um, initially. And so it's, you know, the books are being developed with an incredible team of local historians and authors. Um, you know, teachers, classroom teachers are paired with the authors, um, talented local illustrators and photographers and designers. Um, and we're really making the books I always dreamed I had and that I'm so excited my children will now be able to use in our local classrooms. So, and it's what we hope will be the beginning of making more and more textbooks in different subjects and different grade levels for not just the Guam Department of Education, but we've also had conversations with CNMI's uh, public school system about also being able to provide this kind of service in the CNMI. Looking at your uh, website before the show, it's really very exciting to see all of the publications that you have. Um, aside from those that you've mentioned, or in addition to some of the categories that people can search on your website are, for example, ancient Chamorro society, anthropology, archaeology, children, cultural literature, um, Spanish European accounts, World War II, you guys pretty much seem to cover everything. We try to, yeah. And, um, you know, what's really been um, exciting for us as well is how do we make these books accessible to our community? So, um, for example, like you mentioned, archaeology. So um, we have a book called Linatla, Portraits of Life at La Texan. And um, archaeologist Dr. Mike Carson has spent, you know, the last couple decades, like really investigating and learning more about uh, the ancient village of La Texan, which is commonly called Retinian. And this is one place where every period of human life can be traced going as far back as almost 4,000 years ago. And he's found all of the evidence of that. And so instead of sort of only presenting it in a more formal archeological report, we really felt it was important to capture it with you know, beautiful photography and narratives that would really inform people about how important this village has always been. And so that's why we called it Linatla, which means life, right? Because um, so much of our our life throughout history is contained in this one special and very sacred place. And so that book actually um, ended up winning our first sort of big book award, the Independent Publishers Book Awards um, for uh, nonfiction in the region, right? And this is looking at the whole region of Oceania. And um, I think it was because it really took something that normally isn't as accessible to the community and made it really visual and interactive. And so the book itself, like for example, has an incredible um, collection of photos about different kinds of artifacts that were discovered at La Texan that then tell the story chronologically of the changes in our ancestors' lives and how they adapted to different, you know, weather changes, introduction of, you know, new people, things like that are all captured through just what was found in this one place. And so, um, yeah, I feel like we're really trying with our books to make sure that um, people can discover something that they've been looking for about themselves and be able to easily access that information. Could you tell us um, about any publications you may have specifically related to the CNMI? Absolutely. So um, 
One of the exciting things that happened this year at the beginning of this year is that the University of Guam Press entered into an MOU with NMC to start um, a CNMI imprint, so a division of UOG Press that um, we will be working in partnership with NMC to ensure is dedicated to publications about the Northern Mariana Islands. And so um, our first publication that's coming out is actually uh, made possible by a grant from the Humanities Council. Um, and it's called a Marianas Mosaic Signs and Shifts in um, Contemporary Island Life. And it's sort of an anthology of essays and stories um, that was edited by uh, two faculty members at NMC, um, Dr. Ayani and Dr. Kimberly. And uh, they received a grant from the Humanities Council, but submitted the book for publication consideration through UOG Press. And we've really been working over the last few years to kind of get it ready. And so that will hopefully be launched by this summer. It's in the design phase currently. Um, and then we also have a book by Dr. Faye Antolon that was um, a project initially funded by the Administration for Native Americans to create um, post-secondary Chamorro instructional um, curriculum. And so um, it's called Phenu Chamorro for Beginners. And it's like a Chamorro 101 and 102. So it's like two semesters worth of learning the Chamorro language. And she chose to follow the CNMI orthography. And so um, this will be a book that's, you know, adhering to the CNMI orthography that would be available for students at NMC or people in the community that just really want to learn the language, but as well to a larger audience of um, Chamorro language learners. Um, and then lastly, one of our big projects we're hoping to kick off this year with NMC is a literary journal. And so um, as part of the imprint, like really having NMC uh, faculty and community members from the NMI sort of coming up with um, an editorial review board and determining, you know, the name of the journal, what the journal will feature, and then doing a call for submissions from the community. And so um, that's really exciting as well because there's so much possibility with an annual journal to kind of give writers like a regular um, publishing outlet so to speak right to kind of get used to the publishing process and then hopefully eventually publish longer works as their own book um, but then they could go to this imprint at NMC and submit their manuscript for consideration so it's the very beginning phases but my hope is that we would be able to help support more publishing efforts um, in the NMI which I think you know, a lot of the books that I have from the Northern Mariana Islands are incredible. I feel like you guys have been so great about um, publishing, whether it's through the Historic Preservation Office or the Humanities Council. Some of my favorite books are, are from, you know, trips to Saipan or the Marianas History Conference. And so really, this is just another avenue for publishing. Um, and, you know, that I hope will continue to grow the number of publications we offer about the Northern Islands. We're talking today about the University of Guam Press, and we'll be back with more after this break. In Northern Marianas Humanities Council, Bulaguinahanya Puri Historian Marianas Zan Kutura, Sinyon Soda SCCNN Futmashon Gis on Mami website, nmhcouncil.org, Pat Besita Gi YouTube, Pat Facebook. Guajaloque diferentes clases en la luna y siña un fan. Y Northern Marianas Humanities Council has usura todo y experiencia en tautau. Did you know that you can donate up to $5,000 to the Humanities Council through the CNMI Education Tax Credit Program? Donations from individuals and corporations qualify and can be used to offset your local wage and salary tax, BGRT, and earnings tax. Call our office at 235-4785 to see how you can support humanities programs in our community and obtain a tax credit for your donation. Sizu Usma Asi, Olomai, and thank you. Welcome back to Your Humanities Half Hour. We're speaking today about the University of Guam Press, and we're chatting with Interim Director of Publishing, Victoria Lola Leon Guerrero. Uh, Lola, could you give us um, a little more detail about some of the other publications that um, you guys do? Uh, one of them kind of piqued my interest. It's focused um, 
at children, I think. Uh, Taiguini is, is the series name or something like that. Yeah, so one of our imprints is called Taiguini Books, and it's cultural literature for adults and children. And so we really launched it with a series of Chamorro children's books. So um, Senora Rosa Palomo uh, had done a children's book writing workshop gearing up for when Guam hosted FESPAC. And, um, you know, from that workshop, we had solicited manuscripts and we selected uh, four that were the first books books that we published. And so um, those are Maguiza Zuzi, Nana Zensi Tatsa, which is written by uh, Simone and Dana Bollinger. And it it uh, it talks about all the ways I know my grandparents love me, right? And it's it's really for the beginning Chamorro reader because it uses a lot of repetitive phrases that enforce the language. It has a pronunciation guide and translations at the back. Um, the next one was Imalingo Napatgun by uh, Senora Rufina Mendiola. And um, it's this really sweet story. Actually, it's um, sort of inspired by her own experience where when she was a child, she had been born and raised in Saipan. And then um, when her parents were sick, she was brought to Guam to be raised by her sister. And so in the story, it's about this little girl who's got this large family and they're all so busy and her mom is getting sick and they sort of forget about her in a way. And so oh. she goes to her garden and she ends up turning into a flower. And then the family works together to take care of her as a flower in the garden. And, um, and so it's really interesting. I always point out how I love that our stories are unique and that they're not only written in our language, but they're also very true to Chamorro storytelling, which is that there isn't always a happy ending. There's always a lesson. <laughs> so in that case, it was, you know, paying attention to each other and nourishing each other, even if we get so busy. Um, the next one was Si Pedro Zani Hilet Oruna Koku, which is about this little boy named Pedro. It's by uh, Lance Osborne. And this little boy named Pedro is like looking for this golden koku um, there's a reward that's going to be given by the Spanish government. And so he goes all through the village of Malesu setting all these traps, but the koku just keeps outsmarting him. And of course, at the end, he doesn't catch the koku, but he, you know, he's like, it's okay, I'll be at it again tomorrow. And then, you know, so again, another uh, lesson. Um, and then the the third was Guaizadzin um, Natrunka Manzanita sort of reminds me of like the giving tree, but it's about these three sisters and their relationship with their Manzanita tree and it's written by uh, Dolores Camacho and it's very sweet um, it shows all the ways that not just the the siblings interacted with each other but how they loved their tree and then at the end the tree gets destroyed by Typhoon Lola <laughs> so you know but they realize that they have their memories to hold on to that even if something is physically gone they're still connected to each other in this three this tree through memory. Um, and then sort of after that, those were the first four that were selected from that workshop. As I mentioned earlier, we have an open call for manuscripts. And so we often get uh, children's literature. And so we've got an incredible collection. Um, there's one more that's in Chamorro and Ha'ani Zen Sienna, also written by Simone Bollinger, which looks at um, her, you know, all the things her daughter does throughout her day, which again also helps parents learn how to say things like brush your teeth or, you know, let's go to Nana and Tata's house. So it's enforcing the language in a very accessible way. Um, and then the other books are written in English, but have a lot of cultural uh, values and they use Chamorro words. So those include like 13 Months in Malasu by uh, Dolores Barcina Santos. This one is incredible. It looks at um, the way our ancestors told time following the moon, so the 13 months of the Chamorro lunar calendar, and then sort of how her family continues to tell time based on like the seasons of the village of Malesu, where they're from. So, you know, the 13 moons were named after um, different kinds of seasons. So like uh, Lumamlam is like the time of lightning, for example, right? Or to Maiguini, the first month of the year, it's like, this is the route, this is the way, right? And so it, it references kind of the beginning of a new path or a new year, but also the 
fact that the mahi come close to the island at that time of the year. So kind of the thing I love about that book is, is in teaching children how our ancestors told time, they also understand what it means to be Tautau Tanu, people of the land, that like time is marked by our connection to these lands and these waters. And, you know, and even though the practices may be a little different, um, there are still ways we still live this today. So for example, in the month where uh, our ancestors would have been thatching the roof of their houses after you know heavy storms is now the month where you know Dolores's family builds a Belen, a little hut for um, you know the nativity scene, baby Jesus and his family for Christmas. So it was really beautiful how she made that connection. Um, and then we have you know Chip Chip Unai is like a book about a little boy that learns how to do sand sculptures from his great uncle, but he's not building castles; he's building like a huge canoe or like turtles or like a hut in the sand um and the goal of, or the intention of that book is to keep trying until you get better at something um and then sort of the most recent children's book we did is called mother tree by olympia terrell and it tells the story of the last adult hudson nagu or um nelsoni serianthi's tree which um sits above the texan in an area where the u.s um military is building a firing range for the marines that are going to be brought to guam and so the book kind of tells the story of this last Hazen Lag, we're trying so hard to grow more trees. And so uh, it's sort of looking at the environment and our natural resources and why we have to protect them. So, so much uh, wonderful, uh, you know, books for children, I think, in the Taiguini book series. And one of the things uh, I think that is extraordinary about this is you've also developed curriculum for grades K through 12 so that teachers can use these, these books in the classroom and at the same time meet their, their benchmarks for what the kids are supposed to be learning at different grades. Absolutely. And we worked with uh, Chamorro language teachers from GDOE to develop those resources and make them available on our website. Um, but also when GDOE had ordered classroom sets of the books, we wanted to make sure that we didn't just give the books to teachers and said, here, figure it out, but that we supported them in the process. And so the teachers we worked with led a big professional development and then even in the professional development, the teachers created even more resources. So that was a lot of fun. Um, and I think that's sort of what I hope distinguishes us as a publishing house is that we we see the value of the book, but we don't want the book to just sit on a shelf. We see it as a community tool, right? To have bigger conversations or to support um, new ideas, right? So I, my hope is that each book inspires at least 10 more later <laughs> because each book shows us what's possible, right? When we kind of put our stories on the page. You recently held a writing retreat to kind of help encourage or help authors encourage each other in this process. Why is that important, uh, you feel? Yeah, so um, we have a fellowship called Manyetlani Mentitsiki, which literally translates into siblings who write. And so this notion that like, um, you know, when you have a writing community, when you have people that um, can help you stay accountable to your writing goals and give you feedback and um, be a regular space to write with, um, it really helps keep you going, right? And so um, with Manyetlani Mentitsugi, we had done this in a few ways. So we have, and it's still going now. So we started this uh, fellowship two years ago. So we have 18 writers in three different groups. So um, six members in each group, and they meet every two weeks and, and workshop each other's work. So every two weeks, they will have received each other's writing from, two writers get workshops every two weeks, sorry. And so they turn in their writing ahead of time and they all get Get together and just talk about the writing um, and then rotate, you know, and then the next two writers go and the next two writers go. So at least 18 writers in our community have been supported in this way for the last two years. But we also wanted to give an opportunity for writers to get away and just focus on their writing. And so we had a 
four day retreat in Malasu um, in a really secluded location where um, people could be inspired by the beauty of Malasu, but also have uninterrupt uninterrupted writing blocks. So we had like four hour writing blocks and then people would share and then four hour writing blocks. They weren't allowed to get on the internet or use their phones. And so it had to be people that already had bodies of work that needed just revision time, right? Um, and so it was, you know, it was an application process and people had to turn in the work ahead of time so that they, they went with a clear goal. And what was beautiful is that coming out of that retreat, uh, two of those writers eventually submitted the manuscripts that they had that time to work on, which was really the goal is that in the beginning, we were receiving a lot of manuscripts that were incredible, a great idea. You see a lot of potential, but it wasn't yet read right and so that was why I you know we started by doing like surveys what do writers in our community need and they had wanted people that they could get feedback from and write with um, time and space to get away like I think a lot of what makes it hard for people to write books is that we have you know a lot of obligations whether it be work or family obligations that kind of always take precedence and so getting away that was why we did the retreat and the last thing was learning from published authors and so um we did this through what we call our creative conversation series so after uh, every month or so we we invite the fellows in our workshop groups to meet with a published author or illustrator and they just talk shop you know and the the fellows ask questions and so all of our creative conversations um can be found on our facebook page if you just look for uog press our youtube page also has like read-alongs we have authors reading the books out loud so especially with the chamorro children's books if you wanted to hear how it sounds um that's available on our YouTube page, also just by looking for UOG Press. And um, if you just follow us on, you know, any social media, we regularly announce when we have creative conversations, um, you know, so and then you can always uh, look for our full inventory of books and submission guidelines at uogpress.com or at uog.edu backslash UOG Press. So you know, I, I think it's so important that writers know that they're not alone in this process. Some people prefer to write alone and are really fortunate in that way. But for others of us, it's really nice to be in company with other creative minds and to kind of just e encourage each other and help make the writing a priority, right? Because, um, you know, I think some of this is also cultural. It's kind of like, you know, it feels like, oh, um, I'll get to that later. First, I have to be here for this, you know, but it's kind of like if we can shift that and see, okay, this is also an obligation we have to our community and to each other. Um, I feel like it's easier, easier for us to get it done, you know, so it's like if I know that I'm accountable to a group of other writers, I'm more inclined to stay up late and finish that writing, you know, um, which I think is very natural of us. It's like if we're doing something for others, we tend to put that first, though. So, um, so recognizing that we really felt it was important to create a viable writing community in Manyatlani Mantitiki. Lola, thank you so much for your time today. Any final thoughts before we go? Um, just, you know, that I'm I'm so grateful for this time and space with you. And thank you for um, giving UOG Press a little bit of a spotlight, um, because I really do hope that people uh, who want to write um, come to us um, for any of the things I talked about today. Um, and, you know, just encourage people to continue to read local books and um, share them with your families, because it really is is a wonderful thing to see our stories on the page. Thank you for everything you're doing to make this available to the world, to our community. And thank you for your time. Viva, Sito Smasi. Agumas. Our guest today has been Victoria Lola Leon Guerrero. She's the Interim Director of Publishing at University of Guam Press. You can find them online at uog.edu slash uog press correct correct and then we have an e-commerce site that's just where you can easily purchase our books and it's uogpress.com this has been your humanities half hour i'm katherine perry your humanities half hour is a production of the northern marianas humanities council funded in part by the national endowment for the humanities 
Any views, findings, or recommendations expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily represent those of the National Endowment for the Humanities or the Northern Marianas Humanities Council.